The scripture tonight is from John uh, 17, verses 15 through 19. I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth, thy word is truth. As thou didst send me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Let me encourage you to open your Bibles to the book of 2 John. You know, there are five books in the Bible that only have one chapter, and that is Obadiah, uh, Philemon, Jude, 2nd and 3rd John. Uh, only one chapter, and, and because they're only one chapter, I think maybe sometimes they, they get looked over. I mean, it's hard to cover a, a full quarter, 13 weeks, in 2nd John, right? So we don't, we don't teach a lot of classes on 2nd John unless you're just going to get into to crazy depth, I guess. And so uh, it's just something that we don't study a lot uh, as a whole. And, and because of that, uh, sometimes we, we miss important truths that are found within these books. Now, it's important to realize these books are inspired by God as much as Romans and, and James and, and the other books that we often study in Bible classes and the, and the books that we often read on our own time. And so it's important that we know the message uh, that is found within these small books. And so tonight what I want to do is I want to teach from one of them, and that is Second John. If you have your Bibles open there, I, I think that we'll find as, as we go throughout this study that the concept of the book is really rather simple. And that is hold on to the truth. And, and I think that we're going to find that, and, and point number one on your outline is that, is, is that the book is really that it's all about truth. I mean, if, if you had to say, well, Second John is about something, what would you say? Well, it's about truth. Now, go ahead and read with me the first four verses of Second John. He says this, the elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all those who have known the truth because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we have received commandment from the Father. And so you can tell from the first four verses that the idea of truth is going to be very important. I mean, he's talking about the, the, this letter that he's writing to this elect lady who, who we don't know who she is, but we know that he loves her in truth. And not only him, but everybody who loves the truth would also love her in this way. He's, he's excited and joyous to hear about some of her children who are walking in truth. And so as we go throughout this book, we're going to find a lot about what that means. What is it to walk in truth? What, what is this truth all about? The truth is, is, is the understanding that there's a standard. And, and, and there's a standard that I, I guess we could say is not debatable. It, it's right. It's true. It's, it's unchanging. I, I tell you, when I was in high school, I, I played football. And I tell you, I wanted to go to a big Division I football uh, program. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I, I really wanted to do that. And I worked out hard to do that. And I... I, I did the things you should do. I, you know, I, I played hard. I, I, I worked out hard. But I tell you, Division One colleges just aren't really looking for a five foot ten and a half uh, defensive end. I mean, they they want a guy who's tall, right? I mean, they're looking for six foot four, six foot five. And and I tell you, I, I wanted to put down that I'm six foot four, but I tell you, uh, no one's going to believe that. Right, because they know that there's a standard that we go by, and by me saying I'm six foot four, just because I say it doesn't make it true. It's true that I'm five ten and three quarters, right? And and so th that's what is true. That that is what is right, and, and it's true because it's true to the standard that that we have. When you understand truth, you understand that there's a standard uh, that that you're going by, and, and it's true in 
in morality is true in our world that that we live in a time where really to to hold to truth is getting to a point where many think of it as a bad thing right to say that there is true is also to say that there's wrong to suggest that there's ultimate truth is to suggest that anybody outside of that is not doing what they should do and that's judgmental right and 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 that's uh, it's mean and it's mean spirited and it's unloving that, that, that many think that to, to say that there is a right and, and you are living that way, that must be arrogance of you to suggest that you're the only one living right or, or that we all have to live the way you're living. I might want to be six foot four, but I'm not six foot four. I am what I am. And, and, and that's true and that's right. And, and so that concept is is one that, that, that many don't like. We want to be what we want to be. Right? And we want to suggest that, that we can be you know, whatever it is that we want. And, and, and I guess we can see it in the world, but, but no more is that evident than it is in the religious world. Right? That there is a right way to worship. As a matter of fact, John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, uh, Jesus speaks of that. It says the Father is, is, is searching for true worshipers. That is those who worship him in spirit and in truth. That means there is a right way to worship him. And, and ultimately, that would also mean that there's a wrong way to worship him. Right? And a lot of people don't want to believe that, that, that there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. But, but what Jesus pointed out is that there is truth. And by saying that there's truth, what we're saying is, is there's a standard by which we must live. There's a right way to worship. There's a right doctrine. There, there, there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And, and what John is talking about in this book is those things that are right. No matter how much somebody doesn't want them to be right, they are right. The fact that I don't like something doesn't change it. The fact that I don't want something doesn't change it. If it's true, it's true, whether I like it or not. And so that's kind of the basis of what this book is about. It's about that. It's about the fact that there is truth. And, and it's that truth that, that we need to live by. As he would say again in verse 4, it's the truth that they were walking in. To suggest if they weren't walking the way that they were walking, then they would be wrong. There is a right way to walk, there is a right way to live, and there is a wrong way to live. And, and so what John is going to be pointing out is that very fact, that, that God wants you to live a certain way, to hold to certain truths and believe those things and teach those things and live by those things. It's truth. It's, it's not up for debate. It is what, what, what God has set. Right? As our scripture reading was uh, just a moment ago in John 17 and verse 17, when Jesus was praying to the Father and said, Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Right? It's the standard that God has given. If God has said it, then it's right. And just because someone might not like it doesn't change the fact that it's right. It's truth. It's what sanctifies us. It's what sets us apart from the world because many in the world won't like it. But just because they don't like it doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's truth because God told us it's truth and, and we need to live by it. Okay, and so, so what we're going to see as we study this book is that it's, it's really all about that. It's about truth. Okay, so... As, as we continue to study, uh, you'll see point number two on your outline is that truth, love, and commandment keeping all go together. I want you to notice this again, and we're going to read the first six verses, which means we're going to read the first four verses again, but we're going to read down through verse six. But notice that how the truth, the love, and the commandment keeping are all kind of weaved together, and, and you, you can't take one out of the other. It says, the elder to the elect lady and her children, who I love in truth. Right? His love was in truth. And not only I, but also those who have known the truth, because the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth, as we have received commandment from the Father. 
And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. And so he talks about love, and, and this love is something that's in truth. And, and he talks about this, this walking in truth, and yet at the same time, he talks about walking in the commandments. And he talks about the, what the truth is or what love is, uh, is that we walk in commandments. And so the, they're all kind of weaved together that if we take truth out of it, then it's not true love and it's not true commandment keeping. If you take love out of it, then you're still not pleasing to the Father. And, and, and so they're, they're all weaved together. Right? And, and we know that. We, we, we get the concept from, from the Bible. Now, hopefully we understand that, that Jesus taught, and, and really is all seen throughout the Bible, that if, that if we don't keep the commandments, then we don't love. Right? I mean, Jesus said in John 14 and verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. All right? When we understand the love that, that God had for us and what he did out of his love, Right? John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's the great love of God that he had for us that sent his Son to die for us. Romans 5 and verse 8 says, But God demonstrated his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is what moved him to act on our behalf. And and that love that he had moved him in to act in, in ways that resulted in, in the, the, the terrible crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so if I love God, I can't possibly say, knowing that, that God sent his son to take away my sin, that I could keep living in that sin and say that I love him. I mean, God sent his son to rid me of my sin problem. So it makes no sense to say I can keep doing the same things over and over again, living for sin and yet all the while saying, but I love him. I mean, that, that, that makes no sense. You, you can't love somebody while you're continually hurting them. If you love somebody, it means charity or goodwill towards somebody. And so if I love somebody, I want good for them. Knowing what Christ did for my sin, I can't keep sinning and, and knowing what it did and just act like it's not a big deal. Commandment keeping is all tied up in love, but at the same time, love is tied up in commandment keeping. There, there are those, and as a matter of fact, I think you'll find as you read throughout the Bible, the people, at least, that Jesus uh, fought against, in, in a sense, the, the, the Pharisees and, and, and the, the strict Jews of the day were not people who were against commandment keeping. Their problem were, were essentially two things. One is they came up with their own laws. I mean, they, they, they created commandments that God didn't even create. But also in their commandment keeping, they didn't do it out of love. I mean, you could keep all the commandments in the world, but, but if, if it's about boasting yourself up and trying to make yourself sound like the best person, if, if it's about anything other than a sincere faith and a sincere love for God and fellow man, then, then the commandment keeping, even, even though you're obeying and even though you're doing what you should do technically, even then it's not right. Commandment keeping is, is not about me keeping the commands so I can lavish all this praise on myself and tell you, you know, I must be the best Christian there is because I keep all these great commandments and, 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 and you don't keep them as well as I do. Right? Or that, that Pharisee that, that Jesus talked about when, when he talked about the, the two praying and, and there is this tax collector who wouldn't even look his eyes up to heaven but, but prayed for forgiveness. And he said, there's the other man who, who would look up and, and, and you know, he, and, and would would talk as if, you know, thank you for, for making sure I'm not like this man. I don't have the problems that he has, and I don't struggle in the ways that he, and he boasted himself up. It might keep commandments, but it's, it's done out of arrogance. It's done out of pride. It's not done out of love. And, and so even that's not right. All right there, there is right and there is wrong. There is truth. There's a way we must live. And if, if you want to live according to the truth, then you have to keep the commandments of God. But you have to do it out of love. 
It, it has to be out of love for God. It has to be out of love for his people. If you take any one of those out of the equation, then you don't have the walking that God wants you to have. You're not living the life that God wants you to live. He wants you to walk in love. He wants you to walk in truth. He wants you to walk in the commands. And, and to take any of those out is, is to not do what God wants. Okay, and so he goes on and, and, and gets into to verse 7. And point number 3 on your outline is this. He'll teach to avoid those who don't teach the truth. Okay, verse 7 through 11 says this. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things which we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. We looked at that passage this morning, and, and again, it's, it's so much about personal responsibility that we ought to love truth. You ought to love it. You ought to live by it. You keep commandments because, because they're what God told you to do and, and they're right because God said to do it. You do it because you love God and you love his people and, and all those three, three things are tied up. Well, what he's pointing out is that, that some people don't live by that standard. All right? they're, they're deceivers. They, they don't hold to the truth and what is right. Now, technically, the, the, the issue that he's dealing with, that, that John dealt with, and you can see it really uh, throughout many of, of his letters, is, is this issue of, of people who, and you call it Gnosticism, but it's, it's this issue of, and there's different levels of it, but, but, but at, at its core is people who deny that Christ came in the flesh. Right? They deny those, those basic things about Christ that, that, that we ought to believe and we need to believe. And they would teach people things about Christ that wasn't right. You see, the, the basic belief that you and I have to have as Christians is that Jesus is the Christ. Right? I mean, we, we have to believe that. And that, that is to say that he's my king, that he's my master. I have to believe that. Now, I can deny who Jesus is, but it doesn't change who he is. Jesus is the Christ, whether somebody wants to acknowledge it or not. Whether somebody wants to believe that or not, Jesus is the Christ. All right, so it's about truth again. It's about recognizing what is right, what is true. Just because somebody doesn't want to recognize it, the fact that Jesus is, for, is the Christ is enough for debate. I mean, he is. But... But what's also true is that he came in the flesh. And, and as, as he came in the flesh, what he did was, was he died on our behalf. And, and we have to recognize that. I mean, we have to know that and, and believe that, that. That Jesus came to us to live for us and died for us. And that through him, we can receive forgiveness of sins. And that through him, we can be sanctified. And that through him, you know, we, we can... We can be found justified. His blood can wash us of our sins. We have to believe those things. Well, there are some people who would deny that. The fact that they don't deny it doesn't change it. It's true. That's who Jesus is, and it's what Jesus did. That's truth. Some people might not like it, but it's still true. And what that means is, is that if they're teaching something other than that, they're not changing truth. They're just deceiving people. They're deceiving people from believing the things that they need to believe. That's who he is. That's what he did. And, and the whole world can deny it, but it doesn't change the fact that he did it. And that he is the Christ. And the, the thing about deception is this. It deceives people. Right? I mean, it does, and, 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 and people get pulled away by it. 
I mean, we talked about that, that account from 1 Kings chapter 13 this morning, right? That young prophet who wanted to do right. His heart wasn't necessarily in the wrong place. He wasn't in it for the money. Even after the king offered him all that money, he, he declined and he said, no, I, I, you could offer me up to half your house. I'm still not going to do it because it's against what God said. His heart wasn't wrong necessarily in that case. But what happened is he took his eyes off of truth, what he knew to be true because it's what God said, and he listened to a deceiver. And what John is saying here is this. Essentially, there are people who are deceivers. They want to deceive you. And again, as we point out this morning, they're not going to walk around with a flag saying, hey, I'm a deceiver. They're not going to let you know it. It's going to be hard to point them out. And they're going to sound smooth sometimes. And, and they're going to talk in ways that, that will, will pull us in. And, and they're going to sound convincing. But what they're teaching is not right. Because it doesn't match the standard that God has given us by which we must uh, match our life up to. It's not true. And so he would even go as far as to say that, that if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, the true doctrine, the right doctrine about who Christ is, if, if someone doesn't bring this, they're, they're bringing something else, some deceptive words. And we're not talking about somebody who who doesn't quite understand and is trying to figure things out. We're not talking about somebody who, who, is, who is seriously and, and honestly seeking the truth. Uh, we're not even talking about somebody who, who's just off and, and no one's tried to correct them. We're talking about people who are adamant in, in their belief and in their deception and are trying to lead people away. And he says, with those types of people, you don't receive them into your house. You don't greet them. Why? Because those who greet them share in their evil deeds. They're helping them in that regard. And, and we ought to never help that. Christians ought to be about truth. It's, it's what we have to be about. What is right? Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. If Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father without him, then no one gets to the Father without truth. And so deception is an evil, evil tool. And it pulls a lot of people away from God. And, and we need to not act like it's no big deal. It's very important. In verses 12 through 13, John says, Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink. But I hope to come to you and speak to you face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. You know, John wanted to go to them face to face. He, he didn't really want to write a letter, but there were some things that needed to be addressed urgently. And apparently the, these deceivers were a big problem where they were. And, and you could see in, in, in a lot of John's writings this idea of, of truth and this idea of holding to the truth and, and not following after deception and false teachers. Now John seemed to emphasize that in first and second and third John, how important that was to him that, that they understood him. And the concept of truth is seen all throughout John's writings. And so it's, it's so urgent. I don't want to write. I want to see you face to face. But I tell you, until then, let, let me write you and, and, and tell you some things that is so urgent. And the urgent matter will always be this. It was urgent then and it's urgent now. And it will always be urgent to God's people. We need to hold to the truth. Never let anyone take you away from it. Never let anyone deceive you away from it. If it's true, then, then you need to believe it. And you need to live by it. If you're a person of love, you will. If you're a person of love, then, then you'll seek the truth and you'll want to know the truth and, and you'll live according to it and you'll obey the things that God has said because you know them to be true. And, and as was read for us in our scripture reading, that, that great truth that God gives us sanctifies us, sets us apart from the world. The world, in, in many respects, doesn't know the truth. They know truth about some things. But they don't know the truth about God and the truth about salvation, the truth about what he has done. Let that always be what you hold to.
Let it always be what you love and what you cling to and what motivates you to live the way that you live. And, and let it be the truth that you seek to always teach and spread throughout the world. There might be some in here who have not yet obeyed the truth as far as salvation goes. That means they, they haven't been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and because they haven't done what God has said to do in order to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Other people might say that there's things you need to do to be saved, but what you'll always know is this, is that what God has said you need to do to be saved is what you need to do to be saved. That is true. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 says there's an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of filth from the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God said that the truth, the truth is, God said that baptism saves you. That's true. It's not up for debate. Uh, some people might not like it. Uh, some people might not appreciate it. But it's what God said. And because God said it, it's true. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 13 and verse 3, Unless you repent, you shall likewise perish. Again, some people don't like that idea that I have to change and become the person that God wants me to be. But just because I don't like that idea doesn't mean that it's not right. God said it. And so it's true. And I need to hold to it. If there's anybody in here who hasn't been living according to the truth, they haven't obeyed the truth. If, if there's anybody in here who needs to study more or, or respond to this, this lesson in, in a way that says, I, I, I want to obey what God has said in order for my sins to be forgiven. And, and they're willing to, to put on Christ and baptism. They're willing to commit their lives to following him, believing that he's the Christ, that, that, that he's the son of God. If there's someone in here who needs to confess sin, if, if there's anything we can help you do this evening to obey the truth, to get your life right with God, we want to help you do that. If we can, won't you sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing the song of invitation?